करते हैं यस वी आर लाइव गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी वेलकम टू कारवान दिस इज ईशान शर्मा एंड विद मी आई हैव अ वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट डॉक्टर सुगोतो रे जॉइनिंग एस फ्रॉम यू सी बर्कली डॉक्टर सुगोतो रे इज एसोशिएट प्रोफेसर ऑफ साउथ एंड साउथ ईस्ट एशियन आर्ट एंड आर्किटेक्चर इन द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ आर्ट आर्ट हिस्ट्री and the department of uh, south and southeast asian studies at cal university of california berkeley he is also serving as the interim director of institute for south asia studies at ucb he trained in both history and art history from presidency college center for studies in social sciences calcutta and maharaji sayaji rao university baroda and along with university of minnesota where he was trained under a very famous an icon in himself whom we lost recently professor frederick asher uh, dr ray's research and writing focus on climate change and the visual arts from the 1500s onwards today he is with us to speak on a very interesting and i think very concerning topic that is cont- contending pasts in the mughal museum agra so without further ado understanding that you are here to listen to the master himself and not me i would now formally invite and welcome professor ray to deliver today's lecture and thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation over to you thank you ishan and i'm really thrilled to be able to speak with you about uh this question of the mogul museum agra and in terms of the saffronization of india's public sphere so let me start by sharing my screen let me begin with a tweet on monday september 14th 2020 ajay mohan bist better known as yogi adityanath announced that the mughal museum in agra would be renamed after chhatrapati shivaji adding that the maratha ruler's name will invoke a feeling of nationalism and self esteem questioning how mughals can be our heroes the renaming was part of the up state government's spree of renaming places across the state as we already know mughal sarai is now pandit dindayal upadhyay nagar allahabad prayagraj faizabad ayodhya the museum in question as many in this audience might already know was designed by an international collaboration between the berlin based david chipperfield architect architects globally known for designing museums such as the St. Louis Museum in the US, the James Simon Gallery in Berlin, and Delhi-based Studio Arcom. Uh, the Delhi-based artists are Studio Arcom have designed projects such as the Jayaprakash Narayan Interpretation Center in Delhi, a cancer hospital in Lucknow, the Vadodara Bharuch Toll Plaza, among other projects. The, the museum was commissioned by the Uttar Pradesh Rajakya Nirman Nigam in 2015. the foundation had also been laid that year by the then chief minister akhilesh yadav as part of a larger master plan to improve visitor facilities in the area surrounding the taj according to the architects the museum would have a built up area of 20000 square meters and would showcase the history and culture of the moguls there would be a permanent exhibition space a temporary exhibition space an auditorium a resource center a cafe stores the exhibitions as we know were supposed to include mughal era artifacts and art weaponry uh, and such other things the architecture of the museum was was really planned in reference to the taj in agra as we can see from these uh, drawings that were produced by the team of architects uh colonnades were built were supposed to be built with pillars close at intervals uh the facade was supposed to be made of marble again reflecting the architecture of the taj a uh, translucent material uh, such as glass and ceramics would allow for light to play within the museum interiors and we can see how 
uh, both David the studio based in Berlin and the Delhi studio really was trying to rethink uh, Mughal architecture in a very contemporary setting, all well and good. But the day after Aditya Nath announced that the Mughal Museum in Agra would be renamed the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaja Museum, Shishir Singh, Special Secretary, Culture Department of the government of UP, tweeted that it will house the cultural traditions of entire Braj area. The additional Chief Secretary of UP, Avid Avanish Avasti, in an interview with the Times of India, uh, stated that the museum will be dedicated to what is Indian, the Braj culture, tradition, and heritage. The circus continued. Very soon, the Jats joined in. The Jat Mahasabha presented a memo, memo to the chief minister demanding that the museum be named after Surajmal, the Jat ruler who had ruled parts of Braj, uh, simply because uh, Surajmal and his son had emerged a strong counterforce to the Mughals in the region. The district president of the, of the Jat Mahasabha said they had great respect for Chakrabati Shivaji. However, he did not do much for the region. We all know this story. As a number of scholars and public intellectuals have noted, we are seeing an unprecedented systemic saffronization of the public sphere under Narendra Modi. Whether we think of Baba Ramdev, Aditya Nath, beef bands, new laws against conversion, changing names of cities or even museums, the illegal arrests, the lynching. Uh, as an art historian, I was very interested in this question of, of the, the claim to display the art of Braj in, in a museum. So let's return to this new museum in Agra, or rather the idea of the museum. <clears throat> As Arjuna Pudarai and Carol Breckenridge reminds us, museums are good to think with. I have been, as Ishan mentioned, I've been working on Braj for the last decade or so. I, as I read this over last year, I, was, I could not help but wonder what would be displayed in this museum, in its new avatar. The museum, we've been told, would be dedicated to what is Indian, the Braj culture, tradition, and heritage. What if we took the UP government's proposal at face value? What would be shown in this museum? So when Ishan asked me to give a talk, I thought I'd take the liberty to create a checklist of key works produced in Braj for the museum. Not that the additional chief secretary or the chief minister of the government of Uttar Pradesh cares about the list, but what if? As the story goes, Braj, as we know it today, was invented in the 16th century. Now, we know that texts such as the Bhagavata Purana, a 9th or 10th century text, designated Braj as that site where Krishna defeated the serpent Kaliya, slew the monster demon Keshi and danced with the gopis. But monumental sandstone sculpture excavated in the region suggests that in the early centuries of the Korban era, Braj was an important Buddhist center. And these are again just two examples of the works that were produced in Mathura in Braj. We also know that Hindu and Jain sculptures were found in this 90 square mile region indicating that temples to non-Buddhist deities were also being built in Braj. In the early 16th century, the region that we now call Braj uh, was still a cluster of sleepy villages. Most of the monasteries and temples from the early centuries of the common era that travelers such as Farsian had described uh, were either destroyed or abandoned. Archaeological evidence suggests that both Hindu and Jain temples were all intermittently built in the region in the medieval period, but it was under Sheh Sasuri, the Afghan commander from Bengal, who had seized the Mughal throne in 1540, that Braj became a very important nodal point, really, in an imperial network of trade uh, 
that connected uh, Delhi and Agra through Mathura. It is at this moment with, with the, the rise of Mathura as an important trading center uh, that we see the development of a rich mercantile center. Thus, it is only in the 16th century uh, that the region we now know as Braj came into being. We all know this history. In the 16th century, Hindu reformers such as Chaitanya and Vallava uh, traveled through Braj and were responsible for rediscovering the lost sites that were supposedly associated with Krishna's life. Chaitanya from Bengal, for instance, during a 1514 visit to Braj, had found in the topography of the region geographic markers that allowed him to claim that Braj was that primord primordial space, the space that was described in texts such as the Bhagavata Purana, inhabited by the divine Krishna. Scriptural descriptions from texts were, were marshaled as evidence. Thus, for instance, a grove in the east bank of the Yamuna became the site of Bhandarban, where Krishna had purportedly brought forth water from the ground. And the site apparently still turns milky even today during the new moon. The Sanskrit term Vraj, literally an enclosure of herdsmen, was frequently used in scriptural sources to refer to that mythic space where Krishna had spent his youth. But modern Braj, as a geographic space, was invented only in the 16th century. Very soon, Chaitanya and Vallava's disciples formed a strong center of Vaishnavism in Braj. And by the time Akbar, the Mughal Emperor Akbar, had constructed his capital in Fateku Sikri, which is around 30 miles north uh, south of Mathura, Braj had become an important pilgrimage center. And we know that from a number of accounts, both Mughal and European accounts. For instance, a Jesuit priest, uh, Father Monserrate, described in writes in his memoirs about the huge crowds of pilgrims visiting the region. So it is in this period of an emerging mercantilism, the, the development of uh, Vaishnava centers in Braj, that an artistic, an extant artistic vocabulary of Krishna worship also develops in the region. So what sort of artistic practices were, were, were coming up? Uh, artistic practices that the UP government now wants to showcase in the Mughal Museum as both Indian and tradition and heritage. So for this talk, uh, I decided to select four works, one from the 16th century, one from the 17th century, one from the 18th century, and one from the 19th century. Artworks that I think are central to understanding Braj's culture. So let's begin in the 16th century. What we see on the screen is a folio from a manuscript of the Bhagavata Purana that had been discovered in Isarda, which is a Tikana or a estate 60 mile, miles south of Jaipur in Rajasthan. It was produced in the 1560s or the 70s. And this Bhagavata Purana, as many scholars have noted, is a very important manuscript in the history of painting in South Asia. Uh, this was produced in the Mathura Agra region. Uh, we have 23 folios from the manuscript that depict events from Krishna's life as narrated in the 10th book of the Bhagavata Purana. And this was one of the first large-scale artistic projects that developed in Braj after Chaitanya and Vallava had, had established uh, strong centers of, of uh, strong centers in the region. This particular folio is a visual translation of a, part, of a verse from the 10th book of the Bhagavata Purana, and it shows Krishna's play with his devotees in the Yamuna, with the gopis in the Yamuna, the river that runs through the region. Surrounded by the gopis, the bejeweled body of Krishna flows with the undercurrent of the rivers, river towards an arena beyond the yellow margins of the painting. 
mar the margin that marks the limit of representation. As we can see, the artist has carefully tilted the pictorial plane to create a sense of spatial recession, while the river diagonally cuts across the surface along a central axis, disregarding margins and boundaries that define the painted surface. The primary theme of the painting is Krishna's Jalkrira, but it seems that the artist has deliberately used pictorial configurations to draw the viewer's attention to the Blue River with lotuses, blooming creepers, and frolicking cattle. The blue of Krishna's body blends into the blue of the river, making it difficult to discern the separation between the river and the divine body. Let's compare this fifth folio from another folio depicting the same scene, a 1520s Bhagavata Purana from Palam, now in Delhi, a suburb in southwest Delhi. The Palam Bhagavata is one of the earliest known illustrations of the Bhagavata Purana, and it is part of an early 15th and uh, a late 15th and early 16th century painting tradition that had developed in the region. Most 15th and 16th, early 16th century paintings produced in the mercantile urban centers of North India shared a certain sensibility that, that was marked by the use of flat monochromatic bands, angular figures, in silhouette profiles, uh, compartmentalized units, uh, solid lines. So if we compare the two folios, one produced in 1560s in, Mathura, in the Mathura Agra region, one produced in the 1520s in Palam, we see that there is something very different happening here. The river in the 1520s folio uh, functions like a flat background or even like a backdrop in a theater. And the narrative of the Jalkrira or Krishna's play with the gopis play, is playing is being played out in front of that backdrop. Now, following pre-16th century conventions, the Yamuna is also depicted in what art historians describe as a basket work pattern. Very clear marked white parallel lines against deep blue water. This technique of depicting water or flowing water with uh, parallel lines has a long history. We can go back to Sachi, for instance, this folio from the Great Stupa, where you have the miracle of the Buddha walking on water. Again, the river is depicted with parallel lines. You could also go to Mathura itself, uh, this particular uh, relief, which has our scholars have identified as Vasu Vasudev carrying Krishna across the Yamuna. Again, we can see that the Yamuna is being marked with white, with parallel lines. Now, while there's some debate about the precise identification of this narrative, we can see that this, this mode of depicting water with parallel lines has a long, long history in South Asia. Now, we don't know if, if the artists of the Palam Bhagavata would be aware of this tradition, really going back to the first century of the Common Era, but in painting, we've already seen this passage, this movement. We see, for instance, in a, a manuscript called the Balagopal Stuti, uh, written by the poet uh, Bilva Mangala. Again, the water is depicted by parallel lines. What we see here in this, this folio from uh, the late 15th century uh, Balagopal Stuti is Krishna lifting the Govardhan hill. And this is really one of the earliest representation of, of Krishna's life in painting. So certainly by the 15th century, even paintings were depicting uh, the Yamuna with this peculiar or this particular technique of, of, white, of parallel lines. And art historians describe this, this painting, this early uh, aesthetic cultures as, as an early Rajput school. The river in the folio flows across the lower edge of the painting 
mirroring the contours of the mountain, that is the Govardhan, uh, the river and the mountain operate as a framing device to allow the viewer, the devotee, to contemplate this miraculous act. Water is both life-threatening, but also life-saving. And it's central to the narrative. On the one hand, Krishna shelters Braj from the torrential rains that was unleashed by Indra. On the other hand, it is river, the river Yamuna marked by parallel lines that is central for the agro-pastoral communities of Braj. So this hydrosocial function of the Yamuna plays an equally important role in, in the Isardha Bhagavata, which was produced in the 1560s. But what is different is that the river is depicted uh, in a very, very different way. And that is what distinguishes this particular, folio, this particular manuscript. And these are two folios from the same manuscript from the 1560s. There are similar similarities, for instance, poetic tropes such as waterfalls or lotuses. But the Yamuna's movement from the background, literally like a theatrical background that we saw here, to the very center of the picture plane, happened in 30 years. So why? What happened? What happened in the middle? What happened th that, that the river moved from the background right to the picture plane, flowing across the painting and really shaping a very different way of seeing the Yamuna? So what happened in the mid middle? Akbar, the Mughal emperor Akbar. A number of art historians have, have commented on this particular uh, manuscript. And the scholars have noted that really this mode of depicting the swirling fluidity of water is something that we see in paintings produced on, in the royal atelier under the Emperor Akbar. Or for instance, the Hamza Nama, which was commissioned around 1562, within six years of, ascent, of Akbar ascending the Mughal throne. 14 volumes, each with 100 paintings. So this is a massive project. If you look at this particular folio, which depicts uh, sea monsters threatening the uh, Hamza's nephew, Nuradhar, uh, again, this turbulent, the fluid vitality of turbulent water, uh, really it's almost as if this, this sort of the way the lines are made is very similar to the imagination of the river Yamuna in Braj, in the Sardha Bhagavata, this, which was produced really within one decade, within 10 years of Akbar uh, commissioning the imperial His Hamza Nama. The compositional and stylistic difference between the Palam Bhagavata, approximately 1520-40, and the Isarda Bhagavata, 1560-1570, was conceivably informed by the new aesthetic cultures, uh, the Central Asian Timurid aesthetic cultures that were introduced by Mughal artists in the interim. If we then return to Avanish Avasti, additional chief secretary's claim that the museum in, in, in Agra would be dedicated to what is Indian, the Braj culture, tradition, and heritage, this particular manuscript won't work. Obviously, it's influ influenced by Mughal aesthetics. Uh, and in any case, most of these paintings are in collections in Europe and in the US due to decades of government apathy and the smuggling of antiquities and again let's if you think about the central vista project uh, so much of the paintings that were produced here are no longer in 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 the country so in this particular folio although it is central to the formation of artistic cultures in in braj would really not fit uh the up government's uh, paradigm of what constitutes uh, the, the culture, the authentic culture of Braj. So we could turn to architecture and move to the 17th century. By the early 17th century, we see a growing popularization of Braj 
uh, as an as a very important pilgrimage center. Uh, we also see the construction of a number of ghats facing the Yamuna uh, that really concretizes this, this metaphysical and everyday function of the river Yamuna that we saw, for instance, in the Sarda Bhagavata within a particular hydro aesthetic arrangement uh, built by B. Singh Deo of Orcha, the central Indian kingdom of Orcha. One of the most prominent constructions in, in Mathura at the Vishram Ghat was this Torana, a Tulabhara Tornada, a ceremonial archway used as a weighing scale to measure and distribute commodities like gold, rice. We know that B. Singh Deo of Orcha had, had sponsored the, this particular Torana when he had come to Mathura in 1614 and had donated his weight in gold. It was a very important gesture. Now, architectural texts, for instance, uh, talk about various sorts of toranas that are used for different purposes, depending on how they, where they are placed, the function, the embellishment. The Tula Bhara Torana is specifically used as a balance for weighing gold and other precious commodities that are then ceremoniously distributed. Uh, according to texts such as the Samarangana Sutradhara, 11th century uh, architectural text, the freestanding Torana was a symbol of, mon of the monarch's royal benevolence. We, indeed, we see similar Toranas, for instance, in Hampi, uh, the 16th century capital of the Vijayanagara Empire in South India. We know that Akbar II had transformed this, law, this, this recognized ritual with deep historical roots into an imperial Mughal spectacle. Uh, in a text, uh, we know that uh, Akbar would weigh himself twice a year and distribute the wealth in charity. And there were festivals, fireworks, and Akbar might indeed have used this particular Torana in Fatehpur Sikri, which is, just to remind ourselves, is 30 miles south of Mathura for this particular royal celebration. In, in Fatehpur Sikri, in Akbar's palace complex, this particular Torana, the brackets of the Torana emerge from this mythic uh, elephantine creatures, creating semi-circular arcs described as the Andola Torana. Uh, this particular Torana we know was used in, let's say, by Mansing in Gwalior, in the Gwalior fort around 1500, or even pre-Mughal, mosques in Gujarat. So for Akbar to draw on both Hindu and Muslim architecture, pre-Mughal Hindu and Muslim architecture, was part of his larger architectural pro program, really, which allowed him to posit his capital complex as a very imperial cosmopolitan culture by drawing on both Hindu and Muslim architectural traditions but in keeping with the largely non-anthropomorphic ethos, the representation of deities, gods and goddesses were removed by a very typical Mughal uh, design. The Torah on the Vishram Ghat was, is interesting because it both incorporates Mughal architecture into, let's say, the sacred riverfront, the Hindu riverfront, of Vaishnava Braj, but also espouses a political significance of the dispensation of wealth. Artistically, the use of red sandstone, which is now painted yellow, obviously refers to the Mughal architecture, but also the Mughal motifs takes us back to the, the, to, to the imperial architecture of the Mughals. Now we know that uh, uh, Gujarat artisans from Gujarat had been employed to construct Akbar's Akbar's capital in Fatehpur Sikri, but we don't know if these Gujarati artisans with that that had built Fatehpur Sikri were commissioned to build the Torana after uh, Fatehpur Sikri had been abandoned by Akbar in 1585. Perhaps that was the case, but if you look at the ornamentation of the 1614 Vishram Ghat Torana. And on pillars at Fatehpur Sikri, we can see how both structures were constructed with a similar architectural paradigm. 
for instance, the lotus-shaped finials, the distinctive, and you can see it here, the distinctive uh, chain and balance pattern, the rosettes in semi-lotus forms, uh, the oblong diamond shaped on both pillars, I can see it here, here. So even though early 17th century Braj was built on sites that were made sacred to Krishna's primordial inhabitants, the discursive framework that structured this architecture was a Mughal palace complex. Now, the Delhi, what we see with this Arda Bhagavata, with, with this particular Torana on the Vishram Ghat, is that Vaishnava devotees in the 16th and the 17th centuries deliberately trying to rehearse a certain intimacy with Mughal architecture, Mughal painting, and this demands really a re-engagement with the political and aesthetic histories of Braj. This history can be best designated in a paradigm that was described in the 1970s by a scholar called Marshall Hodson as the social and cultural complex historically associated with Islam and the Muslims, but among Muslims themselves, even when found among non-Muslims, this idea of the Islamicate. Uh, scholars of South Asia have also developed this idea of the Islamicate through uh, analyzing non-Muslim art, architecture, clothes, sartorial cultures that make visible shared sensibilities, codes of con conduct, and aesthetic systems in the subcontinent. In a similar vein, the manuscripts like the Sarda, Bhagavata, or riparian structures, such as this particular Torana discussed here, really offers a very rich testament to the Islamicate cultures that permeated the land of Krishna from its very establishment in the 16th century. But let's jump another century, mid 18th century. By the time, the Mughals were no longer as, as powerful. Consider, for instance, this mid 18th century Ganga Mohan Kunj in Vrindavan. This is the first temple in Braj to move away from that earlier 16th and 17th century architectural uh, vocabulary of red sandstone, austere surfaces, limited ornamentation. What we see on the screen on the right is the Govindev Temple, Vrindavan, 1590, one of the most important temples to be built in this period. Incidentally, the, 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 the dedicatory inscription of the Govindev Temple refers to Akbar. Uh, Akbar's patronage led to the building of this temple. But that was an earlier moment of it, the Mughal history. By the 18th century, the Mughals are not as powerful. So perhaps here we can find that authentic Braj culture that uh, the UP government is looking for. I'm sorry to say, but even at this point, the Ganga Mohan Koj in Vrindavan is actually modeled on the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan's public audience hall. Flat roof structure. Uh, as you can see, there is no, no superstructure, no shikara. Uh, the facade is constituted through repeating cusped arched colonnades. Like, like here, we see similar colonnades. The sanctum, where the icon would be kept, again, with cusped arches, uh, acanthus decorated baluster columns, is strikingly similar to Shah Jahan's throne. Uh, by housing Krishna, by housing the icon in a Mughal style colonnaded pavilion, the patron, uh, 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 Ganga, the, uh, the Ganga Mohan Kunj, the patronage was the wife of, of the Jat ruler. Uh, the patron was emphasizing an architectural metaphor that again made Mughals the source of symbolic legitimacy and power. Now, we know that within the Mughal context, and scholars have argued that these baluster columns that we see in Shah Janabad and elsewhere served as a reference to Shah Jahan or the monarch's imperial power. 
the columns have their origins in European uh, European print culture. Uh, the use of flowers carved in subtle relief, also based on European prints circulating in India, emphasized the Mughal emperor's buildings as a paradise on earth. Perhaps this Quranic symbolism asserted through the use of floral imagery resonated with in, in Braj, where, where, where the region, where the pilgrimage site was described as a bejeweled bower, as a kunja, as a grove where Krishna would dally with his consort Radha. One could then argue that 18th century temples such as the Ganga Mohan Kunj in Vrindavan drew on two symbolisms. One, Shah Jahan's royal allegories, the idea of architecture symbolizing a paradise on earth, but also Braj as a lush bower, a kunja, to articulate an architecture that inextricably linked Mughal palaces to the temples in Braj. But the question is why? Why in the 18th century? Shah Jahan had died in 1658, almost 70 years before the development of this new temple typology uh, in Braj. Moreover, by the 1740s, the Mughal Empire had been reduced to merely the lands adjoining Delhi. Yet, it is precisely in this period of Mughal political decline that temples with floral imagery uh, emulating Shah Jahan's architecture was built in Braj. Now, scholars have written on this temple style and have argued that this new flat roof temple, when we think of Hindu temples, we think of sh temples with huge shikharas, right? As we saw in the Govindev. But this new flat roof temple that emerged in the 18th century, scholars have argued, uh, the precedence lies in domestic architecture. But the absence of a superstructure is explained in, in scholarship, uh, regressive scholarship, as because of the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb's supposed defacement of the Govindev in Vrindavan. Uh, scholars have written, and I'm quoting a scholar called Arnath, who writes that sacred architecture in India had hitherto been guided by traditional theory for the purpose of creating harmonious beauty and auspiciousness. In this adverse time, adverse because apparently uh, Aurangzeb had destroyed the, the cultures of Braj by destroying the, the, the Govindev and all the icons had moved to Rajasthan, for instance, Nadwara, Kota and elsewhere. In this adverse time, the protection of the deities, and this is Arnath writing, called for greater flexibility, even if it meant surrendering some ancient forms of construction. So the argument is because the Mughals were attacking, so were purportedly attacking Hindu temples under Aurangzeb, the superstructure was given up and you were, they were constructing temples that looked like domestic architecture. Now Mughal records completely challenge and do not corroborate this line of reasoning. We know that even under the reign of Aurangzeb, there was massive imperial patronage to Braj. Setting aside such, such really problematic assertions, it is easy to see how the flat roof Ganga Mohan Kunj in Vrindavan was really an emblematic of a new citational vocabulary that emerged in the 18th century across regional courts with the cultural vacuum that ensued with the Mughal political decline. So the my point is, even when the Mughals were declining in power, their cultural architectural legacy became so important that they were being emulated, not just in Bharat, uh, not just in Vrindavan, but we see this in Bharatpur, we see this in Deg, we see this in Jaipur. Over and again, this, this, the, the, the architectural typology that is being introduced in this regional courts and these pilgrimage sites really draw from Shah Jahan's architecture. So again, we see the problem of trying to claim a certain authentic Hindu Braj culture in for, for a new museum that's coming up. By 1832, the territories that constituted British-occupied Braj 
were incorporated into the newly formed Mathura district with its headquarters in the town of Mathura. We are coming to the moment of colonialism. Uh, my last example from the 19th century, the formation of the Mathura district subsequently led to the establishment of a colonial administrative structure modern hospitals, schools, jails, printing presses, a strong British police system. It is precisely at this point that we see a new architectural typology coming up in Braj. What you see on the screen is the Shaji Temple, Vrindavan, built by Shah Kundanlal, a, a, a banker from Lucknow who migrates to Vrindavan after the fall of Lucknow, after Wajid Ali Shah uh, moves to Calcutta. Most of his courtiers moved to Calcutta with him, but this particular uh, banker moved to Vrindavan and built this temple in Vrindavan in 1868. Very interesting structure. Architecturally, it, it emulates the colonial structures that were built in Calcutta, Bombay, and other colonial cities. The neoclassical architecture, we can see a colonnade, we can see neoclassical pillars. Uh, so in a way, the new architecture of 19th century Braj under colonialism was drawing on British architecture to articulate once again, a different architectural style in the region. Yet, the entrance to the Shaji temple, and you can see it on the left, was built on the Rumi Darwaza in Lucknow from 1784. It's very similar, the use of this, again, these cusped arches, the floral patterns. We also know that from, from archival evidence that there was this waterwork built into the Rumi Darwaza. We see similar uh, a similar uh, technique of what display of water also in the Shaji temple in the heart of Brindavan. So why did, why did uh, this particular patron draw on both British architecture and the architecture of Lucknow? The citation of Lucknowi architecture goes beyond the gateway. Once we enter the temple, we can see fish uh, being depicted on the front facade. Uh, we know that a pair of flanking fish was used in, in by the uh, Lucknowi uh, monarchs, and it was sort of a marker of their, and it was the royal emblem. So again, we see over and again symbols that were distinctive of Lucknowi architecture, or the architecture of Lucknow, the Muslim architecture of Lucknow, very specifically, being cited in this particular temple. It gets more complicated. Once we enter the temple, there is a sculpture of Wajid Ali Shah on the mandapa. And we know from a photo, one of the only photographs of the, of the last ruler of Lucknow, that this was really very similar, the, board, the way the facial features, the hair, the, the distinctive mustache. So you have a Hindu temple built in the 19th century under colonial modernity. The patron is drawing from the architecture of Lucknow, is depicting his beloved Wajid Ali Shah in the, in the mandapa, but also referring to the Rumi Darwaza, the fish motif that was so, so, was so central to Lucknow's architecture. This particular temple gets more complex. The facade, has these, uh, what in Hindi, what locally is called the Terakamba and the Mandir, and the temple is known as the Terakamba Mandir. Essentially, these, uh, these columns, these uh, Solomonic columns that were based on Bernini's very famous baldachin in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This is a Catholic architectural motif that really what we see in Goa, we see in Macau, we see in other parts of the Catholic world. And again, you can see the Basilica of Bomb Jesus and this, call, this particular column type that is used in the altar. But this was not a column type that was really popular in, in North India, at least as far as I know, until the construction of the Shaji Temple. So what we see here is that the, the, the patron is referring to room the Rumi Darwaza, but also Rome, the Western ideal, the Western 
uh, imperial idea of Rome to create this new architectural vocabulary in the 19th century. He brings together colonial British architecture, the architecture of Lucknow, the architecture of Roman Catholicism to create this very uh, interesting model of 19th century architecture, which, by the way, was dismissed by scholars. In fact, Frederick Krauss, who writes around the, uh, the colonial district administrator, compared this particular temple, uh, described as vulgar, and compared it to a casino in London. But if we read the architecture carefully, what we see is this very interesting citational politics at a moment of loss, at a moment of the loss of sovereignty, at the moment where Mathura is now under British colonial administration, that really is brings together diverse architectural paradigms from across the world to create a new global architectural paradigm. So even in the 19th century, it is very difficult to find an authentic Indian tradition and heritage. So I just, when I was, when Ishan was really, when Ishan asked me to give this talk, I was like, I wondered what is Braj's culture? What is Braj's tradition? What is Braj's heritage that, that becomes, has become so central to a certain new political discourse? And the examples, these works, and these are just four works that I selected from the various sorts of both painterly uh, architectural, but also gardening practices that emerged in the region in conversation with Mughal paradigms, in conversation with Lucknow, in conversation with diverse artistic and architectural practices across the world. So if, if we are taking the UP government's new dictate as face value, the museum will be dedicated to what is Indian, the Braj culture, tradition, and heritage. One is left with this question, what is Indian? What is Braj's culture? What is Braj's tradition? And what is Braj's heritage? So I want to sort of stop here. This was a very uh, speculative paper trying to think about how to write a history of a Hindu pilgrimage site in relationship to diverse non-Hindu practices. And I'm, I would love to talk more. And maybe if you have questions uh, or even comments. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ray, for that wonderful session. Maybe we can call it thought-provoking rather than wonderful, because it really makes us think of what really is Indian heritage that we talk about, and what really meant by the government's mandate when they say that they will display the Brajis culture, as you pointed out, and the investigation that you did today uh, on Karwan really is, I think, going to open minds of public and really make, make they, this will make them think that, you know, really, we have to think about our, we have to really talk about our heritage. Uh, so if our participants have any questions, they can write it in the live chat or they can email us at Karwan Heritage, K-A-R-W-A-N, Karwan Heritage at gmail.com. We'll forward those mails to Dr. Ray and he'll be back with the questions. He'll, he'll be back with the answers to you all. And I'm really thankful to uh, Dr. Ray for accepting this invitation, considering it's it's a holiday in the US and and, 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 and I think it was lovely to have him this evening. So uh, I, I would rather ask you a question, a very general question. As a scholar yourself, how do you see the present uh, idea of the central vista and replacing museums because museums and archives do not really take replacements and displacement very easily so what dangers are there according to you as a heart historian uh, displacing the national museum which contains a lot of treasures of our past i think it is going to be a disaster for 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 india a uh, disaster not just in terms of the loss of documents. We know that many manuscripts will be lost. Uh, many archival documents with the from National Archives will be lost. We must remember that the most important collection, and I'm just speaking from my own research, the Mathura documents are in the National Archives, which really allows us to 
sort of uh, a huge collection of documents that talk about that allow us to sort of unearth this history of of Mughal uh, interactions in Braj. Much of this will be lost, but what will come up after that? And that is extremely scary. And I see Kavita here. Kavita has, of course, written so much about the role of the national in creating narratives at the National Museum and, and the idea of the national as it was displayed uh, there. Uh, again, what will be the national? From the national, we move to the nationalist with, with new uh, display practices that will emerge uh, in Delhi, in the Mughal Museum in Agra, which will now be called the Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum. So I think what we will see is the move from what Kavita so beautifully talked about as the national to the nationalist and a complete erasure of these syncretic histories, these histories of, of co co-living, these histories of borrowing. And again, it went both ways. It was not as if it was just coming to Braj. We see how Akbar was also drawing from certain practices of devotionalism to articulate his kingship. So this long history of syncretic belonging and living together that is being being destroyed under Modi's regime will, will be concretized with the new museum, with the new cultural practices, uh, the way history is being rewritten as well in, in India. So I, I mean, yes, I think the move from the national to the nationalist is what we, what we will yeah. see. Yeah, so according to you, name politics and the displacement, I think, might be considered, but the, the main thing should be how history is displayed to the public rather than the name that it, it carries or whatever. Right. And I think that is what my talk was trying to sort of articulate in a way that you could call it Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum. You could call it uh, whatever you could call it. But what do you show in the museum? What does it what does it what what works do you display? And how do you narrate that history? And I think what is important here is the his, art history, is the role of serious scholarship that uh, that that will that will that will allow us to retain at least to a certain point that heritage uh, as we see a bureaucratization of museum cultures a deprofessionalization of curating in these museums in these new uh, ventures will lead to a certain way of writing history that 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 uh, that really sort of negates uh much of what has been done, much of what art history has done over many decades to carefully bring up, unearth these, these different uh, histories of, of, of syncreticism or the Islamicate. And I'm perhaps not, I am really, I mean, you talk about Kavita's work, you talk about Kathy Asher's work, you mentioned Rick Asher, my advice is there are generations of scholars have shown that that let's say the Govindev temple or even uh, much of Braj's culture was part of this political, uh, social, cultural, artistic exchanges. And I think the role of art historians, uh, the role of scholarship in, 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 in trying to sort of retain that history will be lost as we move to a more bureaucratized model of, of museum professionalization. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Sukhdev Sohal. His question is, do you see cannibalization of Mughal architecture site in the modern times to suit parochial interests of uh, political reasons? I do, absolutely. I do think that it is the, 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 the destruction of Mughal architectural uh, sites uh, is part of a certain political agenda. And I mean, I can only, I mean, we all know the history of the Barbary Masjid and, and that is just one example of many, many uh, Muslim uh, sites, whether it's shrines, whether it's palace complexes that are both being destroyed by a certain uh, parochial conservative discourse, but also apathy, I would say. We have to keep in, we have to also remember that there is a great apathy for history. And that is why I think what you are doing in Karwan is so important is to remind ourselves of this long history. When I was, when I'm doing field work, I go to so many important sites that are, that are overrun, that are now used for keeping goats, 
uh, in rural India. And I cannot imagine this happening in any in Europe, for instance. Uh, but we are we don't care about the past. We don't care about uh, how uh, how to preserve and protect and write about the past. And I think it's both a conservative discourse that targets uh, Islamic monuments, but also a certain apathy that comes from, let's say, the bureaucratization that I was referring to, that, that you do not have scholars, you do not have uh, art historians in the archaeological survey, you do not have art historians in the museums. The, the, the curating of India's history, the preservation of India's history is no longer uh, the part is no longer uh, a project of scholarship. And I think that will have a very, very deep toll in the long run. Uh, yeah, we have a question by Ravindra Basavada. His question is, how do you really look at this huge push to develop mu museums all over, but not caring for what we already have as national museum? Mm -hmm. That is, I'll, I'll, I'll answer with a personal anecdote uh, here. A friend of mine, and we always joke that every time there's a new government, they want to do something new and rethink the wheel. And it's never about protecting institutions. It's always about institution maker, making. Everyone is institution maker. Everyone wants to rebuild and redo and remake. And I think what we are losing out is that is is that long his that that this long history from the 19 um let's say even i would go earlier not just the mid 20th century but really the early 20th century of a history of conservation of a history of restoration of a history of documentation that has been part of 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 let's say uh, museum uh, professionalism in in the in in the in, in india but that said i also think there are i mean the new museums that are coming up uh, from, let's say, the private sector, perhaps then is the way forward. If this government is going to fail us, we are the state is going to fail us. It is a sad, it's perhaps symptomatic of the neoliberal economy that we live in, that we now have to turn to private the private sector and think about private museums. And a number of private museums have come up across India. And again, as an art historian, it is easier for me, for instance, to work with a private museum than with, with state museums because the, the system is so opaque. This is the, the archives are not accessible to scholars. It's arbitrary. So in a way, it's perhaps only telling that that this new neoliberal post-90s India, the, the, the pro protection of culture and heritage is now in the hands of the private sector rather than the state. The state has evacuated, and what has come up in 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 its place is this very dangerous rhetorical tool that 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 uses the past in very very political and very conservative ways. Yeah, thank you so much, Doctor Ray, for for taking your time to deliver this lecture, for engaging with the public, and we hope to host you again very soon and to talk about Braj more. And truly, this you have given us a food for thought that we should ponder about and we should talk about in public on our heritage and what we are going to do with our heritage. Because no political institutions or agencies can save the heritage or build the heritage. It is in the hands of the people. So we, I'm really thankful for the lecture. I, and I thank you, Ishan, and I thank Karwan for really creating this conversation in the public discourse. And it's very important, and it's very important to have these conversations, remind ourselves. Yeah, uh, we have two more comments, if you wish to take in. It is by Professor Kavita Singh and James Westcott, so we'll probably take those. This is by James Westcott, and uh, he has two questions. Imagine as a further thought experiment as a UP Heritage Officer listened to your paper today and said, we love the way you have articulated the cosmopolitan qualities of the Bridge regional culture. Will you work with us on the car, uh, on the Agra Museum program towards the end of the, uh, towards this end? Second question is, you mentioned the referencing of the Taj Mahal in the museum design. Do you see other architectural references too? Thank, thanks, thank you, Jim, and it's wonderful to see you. Uh, much of what I 
understood of the museum's design process was really from the the from the website and sort of the archival material that the two studios had made available and I, I, again it's really at this point it's the construction is not even complete and i believe i think for covid it sort of is stopped stalled for now so i do not know what is going to happen to the design and how it's going to be transformed under the new i mean the very clear references to the mogul architecture i'm not sure if it's palatable to the to the up state government uh would i be uh, willing to work with the agra museum i am very sure that the, that the up government would not want me there but if they do i would be very willing i mean that is part and parcel of what we do as scholars as art historians even though the government's policies are unacceptable to me in various ways i'm sure jim even you like all of us would be more than happy to 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 work and consult with with the indian government if they were if they were to take us seriously but they don't take us seriously it's all about whatsapp the whatsapp university there are many scholars in the whatsapp university and our voices are really marginal in that sense uh this is a comment by dr singh and you spoke of the misfortune of the indian monuments and museums that are not cared for by professionals but today a lot of the discussion around conservation and preservation also looks at the role of communities communities who care for monuments giving them meanings different from the original perhaps or communities that have wiped out by history or been removed through professional care that takes over yeah thank you kavita and i and i and really this is a central question in terms of of thinking about uh yes uh so i, I so this is i think uh, you know i i really think it's a very important question to ask and uh let me sort of move out of the us and 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 turn to in i'm sorry move out of india to the us and talk about american uh, museums so there is a lot of emphasis on community community participation thinking about museums as spaces for community but if we think about the major political force in the us when it comes to india it's it's a certain soft right community and they have been pressuring uh museums to change the discourse to fit with a certain hindutva ideology in fact i read this particular piece that i am actually going to use in my classes later where the central where someone and i forget who wrote that that the destruction of the central vista project was the first time we are decolonizing india's history so very interesting that that a lot of conservative political forces are using these these ways of thinking about decolonization so and and if you think about the analysis he's the person who wrote this is correct the person is saying that this was a colonial project if you think about lutian steli and we need to and and to the 1950s and 60s there were these puppet uh, rulers who was who was stuck with their western mentality and their obsession with secular history and their obsession with western time and western history so finally india has come into being and therefore heritage is now an indian tradition and therefore we are decolonizing delhi i wonder kavita what you would think if we if we saw the central vista project as a form of decolonization as a form of like that what we are seeing let's say in the us with with the black lives matter movement in terms of toppling monuments and and this use of decolonizing and the problem the problem of professionalism the problem of the western academy and western knowledge systems not just the western academy but the western knowledge systems that are fundamental to a scientific approach to museum studies from the early 20th century deeply colonial deeply problematic deeply part of a certain top down uh, governance but i i wonder kavita if you would want to think about communities as a form of decolonizing when it's when the same rhetoric is being used by let's say at least in the us by hindu to ideologues to change the syllabus to change museum displays i agree but the and i completely agree with you kavita but i think i was i was i was 
amazed at the writing, this particular blog that I read, where he's actually drawing on critical, he, I think, is drawing on critical theory to argue that, that this is a form of decolonization by unrooting uh, the colonial and the con and then the Congress, of course, who are seen as mimic men of drawing on Baba. So I think it's fascinating how, and again, this is not a very popular way of thinking about the problems of community participation in museum. That said, we also have to distinguish between different sort of curatorial and museum practices. There are museums that are community driven, that are community oriented, but there are museums that are not, that are different. So I think we ha also have to open up the question of what is a community museum and what is a museum of and of uh, of the state, let's say. And I think that will allow us to think further about what the question of of community, what is, where is the community? Who is the community? How much is the community have the right to say? And which community? I think that is the question, which community? Because in the US, the community is, that has, is most vocal in the public is, is a certain uh, conservative political force that also uh, so financially supports the Hindutva in India. So I think the question is, which community are you talking about? Yeah, and when we are talking about Central Vista, there is an announcement for the for the audience. Uh, we have a session with Professor Narayani Gupta, who is one of the most known urban historians of Delhi. And we have a session with her on the 8th of July, uh, titled, What? A Janpath or a Rajpath? So it is on the Central Vista project. So do join us for that. It will be live on the Facebook page at 5 p.m. on 8th of July. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray, and thank you so much, uh, Professor Singh and James and everybody who, who joined us uh, for, for this session. It was truly an, a, a learning experience for me and for many, many students across the world. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And have a great evening ahead. <laughs>